know, uh, have you ever watched your little kids like play their first team sport? Everybody, if you've had that experience, I know some of the, you know, if you're not parents in the room, just imagine with me along. You know, our Blaze, they played some flag football early on at the YMCA. And those, those first few years, they were interesting, right? This is just, it was a chaotic scene. The coach calls a play, but the quarterback just does his own thing or forgets to give the ball away. Maybe he just runs himself and off he goes. The kid who didn't get the ball, who was supposed to, is crying because he's upset because I was supposed to get that ball. The defense doesn't actually want to stop anybody because they've been taught for their, all of their short lives that they should share and not take away. So they don't want to get in trouble and take that ball away, right, or stop somebody. Then, then one of the defensive players is just chasing a grasshopper over here. Some of the kids have just, it's just given up. It's too hot, and they're just laying on the grass like this. I can't do this. We can't go about that. But then there's always that one kid, right? He's just got a little bit of an edge. He's learned a little bit earlier than the rest. His competitive juices are flowing. He's getting all the tackles, all of the, all of the, all the touchdowns. Like that's, that's usually the way it goes. And as a dad, you're just sitting on the sideline debating in your head whether you should be screaming out instructions to all the kids because clearly these parents didn't do a good job or maybe beating yourself up because I should have maybe prepared a little bit better for this, right? So as we look at this, everybody's on the team, right? They're all there on the team, but they're all playing a different game. Right? I can get you, I hear that, you know, the parents are agreeing with this. You maybe have had this experience. It wasn't just my experience in this one spot, right? Now, we accept that this is just a learning process for kids. This is how it, this is, this is a natural part of learning and growing and that. But what would happen if this was like the Illinois football team, right? Football season's about on us. We're excited. We're ready to go. But what if we showed up and all the players just decided, eh, I'm going to pick my position today. I'm going to do what I want. I don't need to pay attention to what the team's doing. I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to run my own plays. It's going to be great. I'm going to chase grasshoppers today. That's going to be good. Right? We'd all be telling, like, it's about time for Coach Beal to lose his job. I can't believe this, right? Nobody wants to watch or to play a, a team sport where nobody's playing as a team, right? So I think everybody, even if you didn't play sports, I think you can kind of understand what we're trying to get here. If you didn't, imagine the group project at school where everybody's studying their own thing and, or nobody's contributing at all, one or the other, right? It's, it's a bad deal. See, what does it have to do with us today? See, when you say yes to Jesus, you become part of a family or a team of sorts. And in this family, everybody gets to play. Each of us is uniquely gifted and called by God to contribute to the family mission, to give away what we've been given. See, we get an opportunity to partner with the Holy Spirit, to give away his hope, his healing, and his love to a hurting and broken world. And not only does everybody get to play, we get to play together. What does that mean? Well, we're going to explore more of this, but, but first I just want to start and just, and just pray and invite the Holy Spirit to come and be our teacher today. Father, we thank you for your presence here today. We thank you that your Holy Spirit is here to teach us, to guide us, to show us what you have for us today. Be with us as we learn. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, as, as today I wanna, I wanna cover three uh, specific truths that we're gonna talk about. And the first one, the truth number one, is that each of us is called to kingdom work. Okay, so what does it mean that everybody gets to play? Well, this is a really good question because it's actually, it's really important to who we are as a church. It, it, it's a formative thing for us uh, in this church. And if you've been around here for very long, you've probably heard somebody use that phrase, everybody gets to play. See, we believe that every follower of Jesus is actually called to follow the example of Jesus' life. And that means we're living lives submitted to the Father, bringing the good news of his kingdom to the world through the power of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is key in this, right? The Holy Spirit is who he sent to empower us to actually do the things of the kingdom. And what is the kingdom? Well, the kingdom is God's rule and reign. It's his, it's his uh, salvation, his love, his righteousness, his justice, and his miracle working power happening here on the earth. This is what Jesus brought to the world. This is, this is what he talked about. If you, if you read the Gospels, you'll hear Jesus talking nonstop about the kingdom. So when we talk about these things, we're talking about doing the stuff. You heard that phrase is another phrase to do. What we're talking about is we're doing the things that Jesus did. That's what we talk about when we say doing the stuff. And Jesus is the one who actually tells us we are to do the things that he did. We're to follow his example. Uh, here, we're going to read in John 14, the words of Jesus instructing his disciples about what, was, what they were to do whenever he was gone, when he went to be with his father, knowing that his time on the cross and his death and resurrection was coming soon. 
This is what it says in John 14, 12. And again, this is Jesus speaking. It says, I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works because I am going to be with the Father. So this, this doing the stuff thing, that's a, that's a bigger deal than you might imagine, right? Because Jesus says, this, do the same thing I've done and some of those things will be even greater than what I've done. And Jesus did some pretty incredible things. Can we agree with that? If we read, doing the stuff just got a little bit heavier. Oh man, that's a big deal. But what does that look like? What, what, is it, what does it mean when we, when we actually talk about how do we think about doing the stuff for ourselves? Well, well let's, let's look at some, some, a list of examples here a little bit. To see, when we think about this, again, following Jesus' example, what did Jesus do? When, wherever Jesus went, he left people better. He left people better than he found them. So if there was sickness, he healed them. And so we learn to pray for healing. That's the stuff. If there was despair, he gave them hope. So we care for those who have needs in both practical and spiritual ways. That's the stuff. If they were seeking to know about God, he introduced them to the Father. So we share the gospel of good news to those who don't yet know Jesus. That's the stuff. If they're oppressed and in bondage to demonic powers, he set them free. So we learn to pray for deliverance and inner healing. He shared about the kingdom and God's love with both his disciples and the crowds wherever he went. So we gather, we preach, and we teach every week to share his love and the kingdom to those who are willing to hear. See, this list could go on and on, but what I want you to understand is that if Jesus is doing it, then we want to follow his example, right? When we talk about this, doing the stuff, heal the sick, cast out demons, <clears throat> set the captives free, and bring hope and salvation to those in need, leave the people you're with that are in your life better because you carry Jesus and the kingdom with you wherever you go. Now, for some of you, maybe you're saying, I didn't even know there was stuff that we were supposed to be doing. Maybe it sounds really exciting to you, but you don't know where to start. You don't feel qualified. Maybe you don't feel equipped to do it. Maybe you feel like one of those kids that was on the field that doesn't know the rules of the game that they're participating in. That can be hard. That can be a tough place. And perhaps maybe your paradigm, uh, depending what church tradition maybe you came from, is that the, or, or, or wherever you came from, is that, well, it's the pastors and leaders of the church's job to do all this stuff. I don't know why Mike's up here talking about his own job description. Just do it. Right? See, this was life-changing to me. I, I didn't grow up in a church that, that actually explained that I get to do all of these things. So when I came to the vineyard over 20 years ago, and again, not sitting in this seat, it was, it was life-changing. It was revolutionary for me to understand I'm empowered to do this differently. I get to live a life partnered with Jesus, empowered by the Holy Spirit, and I actually get to see those miracles that we read about in the Bibles happen right here and right now. It's real. That changed my life. Because the truth is, everybody gets to play in God's kingdom. But we have to understand, where do we get to play? And this is truth number two. Each of us has a role, an assignment, and we've been uniquely gifted by God. That's truth number two. So in the, in the Apostle Paul, who, who actually wrote a lot of the New Testament, uh, in, in several places in the New Testament, he talks about these gifts that we've been given. But I want to take uh, some time in Ephesians as we look at that. So he wrote, he talks about that. You can read through those. We're not going to read through all that today. But today I want to read in Ephesians some things where he talks about what it looks like to build up the church. That's us, the body of Christ. What does it look like to do that? How do we do that? And talk about this idea of, of equipping a little bit. And so we're going to start in Ephesians 4 in verse 11. We're actually going to read a broader section of the scripture, but we're going to stop and kind of break it down just a little bit as we go. And so this is Ephesians 4, 11 through 12. And it says, now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and the teachers. And their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. Now, I don't have time to fully unpack all of the, the richness of explaining all what these different roles mean. And the, the titles can sound a little bit churchy, you know, in the, in, as we look at those. But they're simply descriptions that help us understand the different gifting that God has given to build his church, Right? So let's take apostles, for example. So often when we look at apostles, that just really means to be sent out. It's often those who are sent out. They often have a fathering gift, a visionary gift, and they have an ability to catalyze and mobilize groups of people to take new territory in the kingdom. That's often what we see in that. Now, evangelists, that might be one you're more familiar with. Evangelists, they're just passionate to tell people about Jesus. 
You got somebody around you that's a gift and evangelist. We got a few in our church here. They just love to tell people about Jesus. They want to bring them into alignment with who the kingdom says that they are and can be. Like it's just their passion. It's just easy for it. It flows from them. And I say pastors are another one. Now, here's the thing. We often use that pastor title, especially in the, in the Western church. We use pastors, it kind of covers as a broad swath. But we're talking specifically here. There's a pastoral gifting. That, that lives, not just in, in, in like in a title, but there's a pastoral gifting that's often this caring and nurturing and shepherding aspect around people. And when, you, when you're around somebody who's a pastor, you'll felt seen, you're felt known, you feel connected. That's what a pastoring gift is. So all, I'm not gonna go through all of those, but that gives you some idea of what they're talking about. But the job of this group of people is to equip the body of Christ, Right? They've been given unique roles. And sometimes those are roles that are living in an actual title, like somebody who actually has the job of this. And sometimes it's just you living your life. Like you're gonna carry some of those gift, uh, those gifting aspects in who you are as a small group leader, as a parent, as a, as a business owner, as a, as a person in your neighborhood and community who's caring for people. All those things can happen. But all of those, the responsibility of those roles is to actually equip the whole church in kingdom work. That's what we get to do, right? So we're being equipped we're being equipped to do the stuff so we don't look like the Pee Wee football team that has no idea what position we're supposed to be playing or how we do it, right? We need to be equipped. Why does everybody need to be equipped? If everybody gets to play, everybody needs to be equipped to play, right? So that's important. They go together in how we do this. You have gifts and passions and talents that you get to share with the world. Did you know this? Some of you actually may, may not know that, that you actually carry something unique that God is bringing to the kingdom in who you are right? Maybe you're, you, you've never thought about it, or maybe you just have felt too insecure, unsure of how to go about it. See, this is why when we talk about understanding our identity in Christ, understanding those gifts and talents, we want you to spend time learning and growing who you are so you know what you bring. Often, it's the natural talents, the places you've been trained, the places that you're naturally drawn to, and the things you're naturally drawn to are actually a good clue for how you're actually called to serve in the kingdom. This is part of what it means to, to play in his family. If you've been called to it, then you get to do it, right? All of those are ways that you can bring hope and healing and light to a world that desperately is in need of you, of what you bring together. So th this should all be happening just as you go about, about your day, right? This, this for, for me, is a personal example. One thing uh, that happened, I was just in the last couple of weeks, I had to go get cookies for my three-year-old's birthday at her daycare. And of course, we forgot to go get those before the day of. So I had to stop on the way. So you're rushed, you're in hassle. I got to go to Meyer because it's right next to the daycare. So I run in. I'm trying to push her and the card all through and find out what she wants. And she wants everything, right? We got to pick one. We just got to pick one. And on the way, and we're doing that, I run into somebody that I haven't seen in a long time. And it's like, hey, how are you doing? I didn't mean to talk and ask her how she was. And, and she's been to share some things that she was struggling with and some physical struggle that she had. So I got the opportunity and said, hey, can we pray right now? So we prayed. And we got to see healing. And she actually saw healing happen and encouragement as I was able to share with her encouragement that I felt like God was speaking to her. And then I had to rush to the daycare and drop off my daughter and get her there so I could get to work for the meeting that I was supposed to be at that I was already late for. Because we do it as we go, right? We do it as part of the life that we live. I got to train, as a part of a training, I got to pray for somebody to do some, some deliverance and inner healing. And, and it was amazing to see them, set the, see the ability to set the captives free when we bring Jesus and the Holy Spirit to play in those things. It was awesome. But then I go back and I had, that night I had to go have dinner with my kids and put them to bed and deal with all the squabbles of siblings and all that stuff because we do it as we go. I get to give. Giving is a gift. I get to give them my resources and my tithes and my offerings here to this church so we can continue to do the work of the Father because generosity is a gift that we're all called to. But you know what? Some of you actually have a, a specific gift of generosity. It's a unique gift that you're just called to say, I'm here to help fund the, the needs of the kingdom. And let me tell you, that is just as important as any of the other gifts that we talk about. We need those gifts. All the gifts working together when they're needed for who they're needed for. See, you all have a gift to share. And doing the stuff should simply look like your life partnered with Jesus. Now, when you say yes to him, you're qualified. We all have to grow and mature, right? That's why we have things like the School of Kingdom Ministry. It's an amazing opportunity to be discipled, to grow. That's why we do those things so we can equip you to do the things. If you're interested, there's a table out in the comments. Go sign up, get interested. I think they're actually having an interest uh, or a, a sample class that you can take like next week. If you're interested just to find out what it's more about, 
Those are things you can do. Kingdom healing is a great class. Getting involved in small groups where you can participate and do the stuff in a safe place. Those are ways that you can grow in the kingdom, that you can be equipped by those who have some of that equipping already. That's a way that we get to do that. If you're on the team, then you're called to be on the field participating in the kingdom. That's what it means to be obedient and surrendered to the lordship of Jesus. That's who he is. That takes us to truth number three. You can play on a team, on a team, and we get to play together. Okay, this is a little bit different. See, God wants our obedience, but he also cares deeply about our unity. See, we're not out here just doing things like the little kids on the football team, doing our own thing. We're actually called to do this together. We're called to be a people of unity. Now, you might ask, well, if unity is so important, why does it seem like followers of Jesus are often just doing their own thing? Sometimes tearing each other down more than they're actually building up the kingdom. That's a good question. I think we should all be asking that question. Maybe we're only focusing on the ways that we want to play the game. We've got our passions and our causes, and that's the, the only part of the game that we actually see as the game, right? Because we get so focused in on the thing that we're passionate about, everything else seems like everybody else isn't participating because it's my thing, and that can be hard. See, there's, there's lots of amazing things that we can be connected and passionate about, right? Maybe, maybe you're passionate about this issue of, of human trafficking and slavery, and that's a cause that you're willing to, to give your life to. You know, maybe you're, you're passionate about those who are hungry and don't have adequate water uh, across the world. Maybe you're passionate about the rights of the unborn. Or maybe it's the lost who don't know, know Jesus or those who are, are homeless and, and hurting and you're, and you're fighting to see them back in, in a place where they're safe and secure. See, all of these things, the list could go on forever. There's probably some of you right now who are upset that I didn't say your thing. <laughs> say it, just say it. The reality is they're all wonderful things. This is what it means for us to come together. When you're participating, the church is participating. That's how we see it. That's how we view the body of Christ working together to do those things. And we need the kingdom. We need the Holy Spirit to be speaking into every single one of these issues because we need kingdom solutions and not the world solutions to these problems. That's why we need you participating in the kingdom in the thing God's called you to. He wants everyone to play in his kingdom, bringing hope to this world. And when we think that we're just playing alone and we ignore those other participants, we're actually violating something that's really important to God, right? Because we don't want to be the one who gets so mad that nobody else is doing the thing that I want to do that I'm just going to walk out. I'm going to be, I'm going to be in a huff. I'm going to sit down on the field. I'm angry. I didn't get the ball today. I'm upset. That's not, that's not the way we want to do this. We're called to be more than one person doing their own thing. Everybody gets to play together. See, this unity is important because it actually releases the kingdom. Unity creates an environment where the kingdom can thrive, where we can learn to care about the causes and the passions of others and put others before ourselves as we do kingdom stuff together. And as we read in this next uh, verse in Ephesians, it begins to tell us what the work of equipping has, what the goal is. It actually talks about the goal of, of, of this is actually unity and maturity. They actually go together. Because we need to be mature believers to be able to be secure in who we are in order to let others go ahead. In order to not see that as taking away from who we are. So Ephesians 4, 13 to 14, again, we're continuing. Uh, it says, this will continue. Again, that's the equipping part we just read about, the equipping of the saints. Until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Again, Christ is our example, the standard of Christ. And it says, then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to kick, trick us with lies so clever they sound like truth. That, that's important. See, we need that unity. We need that maturity. We need the standard of Christ so that we're not blown about by every wind of new teaching. How, how relevant is that for us today? Today, when we have access to new teaching, everybody's idea of their truth, that they want your attention to come pay attention to this thing, Every single one of us is bombarded with that every single day. But when we're rooted and equipped, knowing who Jesus is, knowing who we are, suddenly we're not, we're not tossed around by that. We're no longer immature like children. We get to play like the pros. That's the maturity that we get to walk in. Now, I want you to, I don't want you to hear what I'm not saying when I talk about unity. Unity, it does not mean compromise with sin. Everybody needs Jesus. 
Everybody needs to know who he is, and we all need to surrender our lives to him. Unity doesn't mean everybody gets their own truth either. And that's a tough, that's a tough one today, right? Because if you believe a lot of what the world tells you, truth is completely relative to the individual. See, the Bible says that truth is a person. That means we have a standard of what truth is. And we get to walk in that, and that's actually secure. That's a foundation that we get to actually walk in because Jesus is the truth that we get to measure our lives by. Unity also doesn't mean sameness, right? We need all the different gifts of the body working together, but unity does mean oneness of purpose. We get to be on mission together, living our lives sold out to the kingdom, surrendered to Jesus with oneness of purpose. That's what it means to be in unity. So what are the next couple of verses in Ephesians as we keep reading on here? This is verses 15 and 16. Let's, let's look at that. What does it look like for followers of Jesus being equipped? It says, instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ. Again, it just keeps holding up Christ as our example, our standard, who is the head of his body, the church, and he makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work. It helps the other parts grow so the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love right? So when we say speaking the truth in love, that can be taken out of context and suddenly be like, I'm going to love that person so hard with this love. It's this truth is just going to, don't do that. Don't do that. I've had it done to me. Julie can attest it's been done to her. Maybe some of you have experienced the truth in love. What does love truly mean? I actually want the best for you. It means I'm going to actually approach this in a way that actually doesn't create more hurt and pain in the process too, right? So when we speak that truth and love, it's important. We're not wielding it from a place of hurt. Instead, we're doing it from a place of love and unity. Again, it's telling us Christ. He's our example. The whole body, it's his job. He says Christ's job is to fit the whole body together perfectly. He wants us working together. It's his desire that we find ways to work together. Even when it feels like we have different opinions and different, different goals and different ideas, it's okay. We are secure in who we are, which means we don't have to take offense when others don't want to do the things that we want to do. We get to just bless them and move forward together because we're still working in oneness of purpose. And when that happens, it's amazing. When we see those things happen, it's like that football team, when the play finally runs right and all the kids are going in the right direction and everybody got the ball in the right place, it's, it's just, it was so much fun. As a parent, you're so proud. Yes, we got one. We got one. It's amazing when things work together. When we do all those things, we do them from that posture of love. And that's when we'll see that the church, as it says, is healthy and growing together full of love. See, our unity is our testimony to the world. See, if I pray for healing in one breath and I turn and I curse my brother in Christ in the next, what does that say to those who don't yet follow Jesus? I don't want to be part of a team or watch a team or connect to a team that doesn't play together as a team. See, we can't bless in one breath and curse in another and expect that the world to be excited to join the team. Unity is the testimony of Christ. Following Jesus is never a me conversation. It's a we conversation. So we all get to play in the kingdom. We get to do the incredible, we have the incredible pleasure of doing the stuff that Jesus asked us to do. But our prayer is that we become as passionate about we as we are about me. Can we do that together? Let's pray. Father God, I thank you today. I thank you today that we get to, to connect together as your body, as your church, passionately pursuing the worship of you. That you today, Christ, Jesus, are our oneness of purpose. And as we worship today, as our worship team comes up and we get to pray together, God, let us be in oneness of worship, to worship together. Oneness of purpose as we glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen.